welcome to World War G. I'm Troy. No more palm fronds, Troy. Now we are the pharaohs. I'm AJ. AJ, what kind of name is AJ? What, do you race cars? Um, so just FYI, uh, today is Tuesday, so that's when you're hearing this, or Wednesday, or I guess really whenever. Yeah. Um, but that's also going to be the same next week. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll be recording again Tuesday because... I'll be busy Sunday. I have vacation. I'm going on Wednesday through Saturday. And then Sunday, got other stuff to do. So, hey, it's summer. I'm sure people understand. Yeah, got things to do. Vacation times. Um, speaking of that, I guess people are really out and about now. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, because yesterday was Memorial Day and I inadvertently found myself in a cemetery. And <laughs> like one does, you know, like, like happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was packed. There really? Were so many people. Yeah. They were just dying to get in there. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, I, um, I had uh breakfast with my brother yesterday. Um, in the cemetery. No, no, that'd, oh. be, that'd be weird. <laughs> oh yeah. That would, that be would weird. be weird. Oh, okay. All right. And no, we got uh, talking about um, how an ancestor of ours actually has a uh, uh, house he built a couple of years ago that's still there. It's in uh, where were we? Bountiful. Okay. So I went and checked that out, and then I was like, "Hey, where's his grave?" I'm like, "Oh, it's a cemetery in here. I've never seen it." Like, "All right, well, let's go see it." So that's how that happened. Nice. I actually really do have this odd fascination with cemeteries and I love taking photographs yeah. in cemeteries. That's like one of my favorite things I could, I literally could spend like, I don't know, days. Just, oh, yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. It's, it's great. Like, <sighs> no, the, the looking at the old gravestones is what I really like. like yeah. Finding the really, really old ones. The oldest one in the whole cemetery mm-hmm. kind of a deal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They typically are the ones that like have the little, picket fence around it or mm-hmm. like a cemetery within a cemetery or something crazy and um i saw like some of the cooler ones that i've seen like when i went to toronto um they actually have cemeteries in the middle of like downtown cities uh-huh. it's kind of crazy but then like it feels so peaceful still and you don't like once you go further into the cemetery you don't even hear like the cars anymore it's it's kind of right. cool um there was this other one that was here locally that i saw it was just kind of funny it was like a mother and well, it said father, and then it had their name and like all their stat, like stats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking video games here. Yeah. What level they were, you know? No, but it, like it said father, and then it said mother, and then it, like they planted. Like I'm sure it was good intentions of the family initially. They planted like a rose bush in between the two of them, uh-huh. and then the rose bush had just kept moving and moving and growing bigger and bigger. I'll have to show you the picture of it. But like they're literally like tilted like opposite directions like there's like a thorn in their marriage kind of a deal oh, really? yeah yeah and it's like they're all wonky now looking like the headstones are kind of out of place because this huge like rose bush that's kind of taken over because like even, the, the roots and stuff have yeah pushed push, it up or whatever yeah yeah interesting i'm like oh there's some like symbolism or like you know i, I found it very poignant at the time mm-hmm. i guess i don't know right yeah right and you're a young emo photographer like this captures the the duality of man, <laughs> yin and the yang, the good and the bad. <laughs> Pretty much. How even the most perfect of things can be damaged. Yeah, I, I'm still agreeing with you. Like even though you're like trying to make fun of it, <laughs> it's like no, yeah, that's that's what that, I was doing. That's exactly wow. Yep, you nailed it. You understand me, Troy. <laughs> you <laughs> you get me. <laughs> All right. Um. Let's get to how does it taste? How does that taste? How does that taste? How does it taste? Uh, oh, another thing I found out yesterday that I never knew. Uh, you know the little town of Woods Cross? Yes. Named after my family. No way. Mm-hmm. Seriously? Woods. Yeah, wood, yeah. Woods yeah, yeah. Cross. It was founded by a guy named Dan Wood, who's um, a distant relative. Really? Did you go visit his headstone? No. Oh. But 
it was his cross or his. I think he founded the place. So that's why he named it. Oh, okay. Interesting. I wasn't sure if there was like because I'll when I go hiking I'll find like the Patty's mine and it's like right. okay that's the mine that Patty you know this dude like was looking for gold mm-hmm. kind of a deal. Um, but I just wondered if there was like his cross was like up on a hill or no it was like I think he's going for like woods crossing you know oh this crossing like, like yeah, yeah 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 while these people pioneers or something were crossing I think that's something like something that, like that intersection yeah. mm-hmm. anyway. Two taste tests. Yeah, found this at work. Okay. Uh, three of the things we always get most of the time are Oreos, Kit Kats, and cereal. Like, yeah, yeah, those seem to yeah. be the ones that are always come out. Those with are stuff. staples of the podcast. So this one is new Dolce de Leche Toast Crunch. <laughs> now, for those of you that don't speak Dolce Espanol. de Leche, yeah, yeah, it's uh, caramel, caramel, and milk. Dolce de leche. So it's caramel, milk, and cinnamon. Uh, that sounds like a weird combination. I think so. So I got I got these these smaller bowls. Yeah. So we can kind of have a. I didn't want to get like huge. Yeah. Cereal in case bowls it or is anything. Like- yeah. Still has that. Cinnamon toast crunch kind of smell to it. Very cinnamony. Yeah, I don't see much. I don't see much of a difference. Um, it there's a little bit. Mm. They seem they seem more puffy than normal. Are they smaller? Am I crazy? Or are they a little <laughs> smaller? <laughs> or are my hands bigger? I can't <laughs> tell. Oh, they're good though. They're really good. It tastes like cinnamon toast crunch, but just a little little hint of caramel there at yeah. the end. It's got a pleasant aftertaste too. That's pretty good, man. All right. I don't know. I feel like this could be a topping on ice cream. Hmm. More than it could be an actual cereal. I'd probably. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if you want. You something. need like an epi pin or something. Right. I was gonna say. I don't know if you want something that sweet like first thing in the morning. Besides the GF. Hey! Hey! <laughs> it's true, though. <laughs> but yeah, that would be a good ice cream topping. Blend it up, sprinkle it over. And I like how even the corners, because a lot of times you'll run into like Captain Crunch where it'll like basically cut your mouth open as you're eating it. I don't agree with that. No. Like how? Because I've heard that before. No, it it does, dude. Like how I eat I eat Captain Crunch all the time. Like how soft is everybody's palates <laughs> that their mouths are getting ripped open by cereal? Like I've never had that problem. Uh, these seem a little bit more rounded corners. <sighs> well, yeah, that's good. See, I think what it is. Is when most people are eating cereal, unlike Troy, when most people eat cereal, they'll pour in the milk, or they'll pour in the cereal, they'll pour in the milk, and they'll eat it, but then you'll end up with milk, so then you gotta pour another bowl to make a room, like, compensate for the leftover milk. Right, so wouldn't that make the cereal softer then? No, I'm just saying, because then, like, it's a little bit, no, it's drier, because the milk's at the bottom now, and then, like, you're eating it, trying... Yeah, and you just eat like three, end up eating like three bowls of it, and then you're. So you're saying because I I I don't do that that my my palate has become very calloused and hard. Yes, like your heart. I was gonna say like my soul. (laughs) Uh, That could be. Yeah, because I've heard that like all my life. Oh, Captain Crunch tears up tears up your mouth. I'm like, no, it doesn't. Uh, What the heck are you talking about? I don't know if we should tease this now, but I've definitely got a really good story about uh, Captain Crunch. That's not safe for podcasts or this mm. podcast. Well, we might as well talk about it now. Yeah. So we were discussing the possibility because we do the we do the DLC. Yes. Right, which is kind of a Patreon ex- exclusive thing, which is kind of a tag on to the episode. <coughs> but we were talking about it might be fun to do something called like World War R or World War After Dark or something like that. 
Right. Where we talk about stuff that would not be safe generally for the podcast. <laughs> it's de- it definitely wouldn't be like, you know, geek or any- nerd related. Right. Um, so if that's something you guys would be interested in, like, let us know. Yes, please do. Like I said, it'd be a Patreon exclusive. But, uh, yeah, I, w- I wouldn't be above really getting into it, so to speak. <laughs> really diving in, you know? Face first. Yeah. Yeah. Just opening ourselves up. <laughs> uh, back to the day stuff, though. Yes. These are really good. I like those a lot. Yes. Um, out of five uh, Dolce de Leches, I'm, I'm at like a, I'm at like a solid four. Like it's it's pretty good. Like I have no complaints. Um, no, not really. No, other than it's a little too sweet. And I would also imagine you'll have to let me know, but I would imagine at the bottom of the container, there's probably going to be at least like a half a cup of just like cinnamon sugar, <laughs> just chilling there. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'd have to agree. Maybe I'm at maybe like a three and a half, I think. Um, it does seem, I guess you'd be using a spoon, but it does seem like a lot of the sugar would just kind of fl- slough off mm. at the bottom. Well, then it'd make your milk taste better, but then you'd end up with like sugar, like a layer of it. Okay. <clears throat> oh, they also have, um, um, I think I saw churro cinnamon toast crunch. Okay. Like, like they look like little mini churros. <laughs> well, that was interesting. Like, when did Cinnamon Toast Crunch be like, hey, let's start expanding out? Right. Let's get, let's get creative. What are other cinnamon-flavored things that we can... Right. Um, cinnamon Roll? Yeah. Cinnamon Roll Toast Crunch? All right. Like, one side could be, like, normal Cinnamon Toast Crunch, the other side could be, like, frosted. Um, did this cover the whole thing in frosting? Mm, <laughs> sounds delicious. I did see that for a limited time, they have s'mores Oreos. Ooh, okay. Like, we may have to pick up, oh, yeah. We may have to Go. pick those up. S'more. If it's got that toasted flavor to it, man. I think they have... If I remember right, it's like the, the Oreo cookie, obviously. Normal Oreo cookie. And then there's like two layers. So I think one layer is the marshmallow. The other layer is kind of a graham cracker taste. Dang. All right. I'm 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 sold. We'll have to get those. Yes. But for now, let's go to This Week in Geek. This Week in Geek. So... We had reviewed, was it, la- it was last week that we had reviewed Army of the Dead, right? Yes. Yep. Uh, there has been some controversial stuff that, like, later on came out. It said, Netflix, Netflix paid big bucks to replace Chris D'Elia with um, Tig Norta. Nataro. Nataro. Uh, whatever, Tig. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Netflix spared no expense removing the scandal-ridden comedian Chris from director Z- Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead and replaced uh, him with Tig. In a new interview with Vanity Fair, husband and wife team Zack Snyder, um, Deborah Snyder, didn't disclose the exact amount. And like later on, like I did, I did some diving, you know, for the podcast. And it was about roughly about $3 million. Okay. But didn't disclose exactly the amount it took to reshoot the scenes with Nataro. But said that it is fairly, it was a fairly easy decision removing, removing him. One, uh, one of the film's producers told Vanity Fair, it is an expense. It, it was expensive choice. While Zach put the cost at a few million. I will say Netflix did right, um, the right thing. Deborah said they put their money where their mouth is. Um, so if like if you were watching it and you kind of remember, there were certain scenes 
where she, you know, they panned over to her, even though she was in the helicopter with the rest of everybody else. Yeah. She, they panned over to her and it was just her <clears throat> exclusively and you couldn't see right. anybody else in the cockpit or around her. And then it panned back to them. And there was like quite a few scenes. Like they had to do a couple of them where they were together before they entered into the city. But for the most part, um, yeah, they completely removed him mm -hmm. out of it. Yeah. Like uh, I think there was a recent interview with her where she said, uh, she never met Dave Batista. Still hasn't to this day. Oh, geez. They were never on set together. You yeah. Know, they never shot together. That she was is, spliced in. That is crazy because, like, it was a little noticeable. Like, I wouldn't have thought anything of it. Just, like, director's choice. But I wouldn't have guessed that they'd never met. Um, the other thing that I kind of wanted to bring up is since it's like playoff season, and this will be a, like a perfect an analogy here, a lot of the teams, when they're recruiting new basketball players or even football players or any like athlete in general, they sometimes steer clear of certain athletes who have like scandals associated with them mm -hmm. or are more prone to like, hey, this, this, um, player he likes to go out and he is a player like in real life kind of a deal he's always getting drunk and stuff nice and shows and party up and, yeah. And, yeah so then they have to weigh the pros and the cons they're like well he's very talented when he's on the field but at the same time he's got a lot of like baggage that comes along with it right like dennis rodman yeah, yeah. um i feel like with uh the same applies to like celebrities as well when you're going into filming and you're trying to pick pick a perfect person you have to take that into you know, like you have to look at all their background. You have to look at their, probably their Instagram, their Twitter accounts, you know, everything that could possibly like, you know, hurt this project later on or make it so you have to like do these changes. Right. Cause like I said here, that was a couple of million bucks, dude. That's, yeah, that's, that's a, it's not a small amount of money. No. Well, especially nowadays, cause people are so much more, um, focused on that and there's so much more uh um there's a lot of light that's been shed on yeah like, you know th nothing is secret anymore yeah right and so now you really you really got to be careful and and chances are it's possible because i was looking up with chris like what's going on with him and a bunch of women have come out about sexual allegations and and stuff like that and it's possible that happened in the middle of while he was filming that. Yeah. You know? And so as a director, you got to think, okay, do I keep him? Right. And risk losing money on, on this movie or do I dump him and get more money and have to pay more money for another person to come in? You know, you have to weigh those things out. Yeah. Right. Uh, I do think Netflix probably like our, you know, Zack Snyder probably made a, a wise choice there and like i like yeah. how in an interview where they even interviewed his wife you know she was just like hey all these allegations you like zach you better you know she might have been like had a a hand in the decision making process yeah. as well like yeah dump his ass <laughs> um and that was also cr crazy is because like you've got a, another celebrity uh james franco yeah, that Seth Rogen has kind of like distanced himself from, yeah, he has. and even what's her bucket from The Mandalorian, mm -hmm. right? Because of like some things that she'd said, like that's gonna, I don't know, that's something I really never like thought too much about. That you have to like weigh these pros and these cons. Yeah, you get these like huge celebrities, but at the same time, they could potentially have something come out about them and damage the project. Well, and it's really never been that way unless somebody really had a massive scandal. Yeah. Like it's never been like as, as scrutinized as it is, as it is now, like celebrities are so like under the microscope right now. Right. Because of how, you know, PC, the culture is trying to be like people have these allegations and stuff. We don't want them to be rewarded. Like, we don't want them to be making these millions of dollars in these films and also being a scumbag. Like, we, we don't, you know, we don't want that to happen anymore. But, and, it, and it, it's a double-edged sword because a lot of the times, some of these celebrities, uh, that's how they became famous. I know. It's because of these scandals, right? And you're like, what the hell? Like, pick a lane, you know, <laughs> society. Who's a lane? <laughs> um, a lane. Which lane you're going to go down? I don't. Oh, gotcha.
Okay, Mike. Well, what the heck, Troy? <laughs> I've actually, I've actually said that joke like several times in the podcast, like in Have the you? past three, four weeks. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> um. Ah, oh, what was I gonna say? Um. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, is it so? Is it best to find a celebrity that is unknown? That doesn't have like much baggage, or a brand new celebrity that's only made like one or two movies, because then you're not worried about them like really people finding out any dirt on them. Um, and do you I'm, think it? Do you think it's also like making people shy away from the profession of becoming a, a movie star? That's very possible, and and if it is, that's fine because you know that that's you can't get away with these things anymore, and that used to be so prevalent in the movie business, right? Like, oh, if you sleep with me, I'll make you a star. Like that happened a lot. Like that was kind of an open secret in Hollywood, right? Like they jokingly say, like, "Who'd you sleep with to mm-hmm. get this role?" Kind of a deal, you know? Ha ha ha. Yeah. Like, um, and so now people are like, no that's wrong. We're not going to do that anymore. And so now they're going back and, you know, uh, I don't want to say canceling because I think that's a a dumb term, but um, holding these people responsible. uh, Cancel culture. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But now that they're holding these people more responsible than they used to. Right. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, I, I, and I completely agree with that. I also, feel like it's it's got to be difficult for the celebrities you know looking at their side of things when they're trying to like also date and they're trying to have a relationship and they're trying to like do you know be like normal you gotta be careful yeah because like there's a lot of people that would like go after these celebrities and say yeah yeah i'm 18 you know or like yeah i'm 21 look i got into this club Mm -hmm. you know you're thinking everything is like legit and come to find out, like, they're underage or something, you know? Like, and the thing that happened with um, what's currently happen- happening with Army Hammer, like, it seems like he's into kind of some freaky stuff, you know, some fetish stuff. And, and that's fine. I'm not here to fetish shame anybody. Right. Heaven knows I got my own stuff. But, and it's like, okay, you got to be careful, though, because... In today's culture, you know, if a woman doesn't want to really do that, but she feels pressured to, and you do it like you think everything's fine, and then the woman comes out and says, you know, I didn't, didn't want to do this, he did this, this, and this, and in your mind, you're thinking, oh, we were just having a good time. Right. But in her mind, it was completely something else, and now your career is kind of in shambles, like his. Right. Like, you just have you have to be so careful nowadays. Yeah. 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 No, Absolutely. Yeah. Like, definitely be on the same page with these people that you're, you know, you're courting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> courting, that's very, very formal of you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a classy kind of guy, Troy. All right. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. A little too much Dolce de Leche. Uh, do you remember the that's show? A word to say. It is. Do you remember the show Smart Guy? Yeah, but uh, but uh, 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 he's a smart guy. That yeah, one, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's getting a reboot. Okay, Disney's '90s sitcom Smart Guy is receiving a reboot, which is currently in development. While the sitcom was produced by Disney, it initially ran on the Warner Brothers Channel from 1997 to '99. Taj Maori. Uh, brother of Sister Sisters, Tia and Tamara Maori, starred in Smart Guy as T.J. Henderson, a quirky 10-year-old genius who jumped grades from elementary school to high school. The series also starred John Marshall Jones, Jason Weaver, Essence Atkins, and Omar Gooding. Um, <clears throat> in a recent interview, uh, Taj Maori said this, Said there's been a lot of there's been lots of Zoom meetings and talks about this, so we do have the ball rolling on it. It's just a matter of time and timing, but we do have the possible home for it. We do have a writer, and I feel like I came up with a really fresh take on how we can bring it bring that back with the whole cast and something that is fresh and new. 
but also something that the diehard fans will still get that nostalgic aspect of it as well. So it seems like not only he's coming back, but it seems like the entire cast right. is in talks to come back. I mean, if they're not doing anything else, you know, why not? Why not? Yeah. Like, I don't think Omar Gooding's doing anything. <laughs> um, do you think this opens the door for a lot more of these shows to be rebooted? Or it's already, it's already, like, it's already happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, like smart guys kind of coming on the tail end of <laughs> all these shows being rebooted. Right. Is there any other shows that you would like to see some sort of a reboot with? These Disney 90 TV shows? Mm. Is Sister Sister already in the works? Or has it already happened? I think they're doing other stuff. Okay. Those two. Um, they already did Full House. Right. What about Family Matters? What if we bring Steve Urkel back? Okay. Uh, would you set it in a different, like, city? I don't know. You could set it in the same city. Did I do that? Like, yes, you did. And we're calling you out for it. <laughs> <laughs> You're canceled. You're canceled. <laughs> um, Steve Urkel has been canceled. Urkel's kids? Do some sort of a like a reboot, like a reimagining of it. Well, because you could do that because nowadays, and we know this all too well, the nerd culture and geek culture is kind of a it's kind of the cool thing right now. Right. Yeah. So Steve Urkel now could be the guy that's popular, whereas the other people that you know thought they were cool, like the the siblings and stuff that thought he was a nerd, all of a sudden they're the ones that are like. They're the ones that are getting, like, uh, picked on and made fun of. And, uh -huh. Yeah. Like, maybe they're not so PC or they're not, quote-unquote, woke. Right. You know, like Steve Urkel is. Like, I could see him being, like, a, a tech billionaire. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. Um, and so now everybody's kind of living off of wearing, him. Everybody's wearing t-shirts to say, did I do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> could bring back all that old... Steve, Steve Urkel is, like, the Steve Jobs. Uh, yeah. You know? <laughs> Could bring back all that old. It'd be really meta, but it could bring back all that old Steve Urkel merchandise I had back in the nineties. Mm -hmm. But have that actually be real? I actually have a picture of me. It's one of the most nineties pictures you'll ever see of me as a kid. I'm in uh, the pants are like. I actually think they're shorts and they're like day glow neon checkered and okay big old sweatshirt that has Urkel on it and <laughs> you know, I have to find that picture. That's awesome. But it's like the 90s in one picture. It's funny. So I don't know how to transition here. I'm just going to go right for it. So John Cena has to apologize um, to Taiwan because he called it a... Well, he's apologizing to China because he called uh, Taiwan a country. <laughs> Fast and the Furious star and wrestler John Cena began uh, learning Mandarin Chinese nearly a decade ago, but this month, by showing off his linguistic skills in Taiwan, he got himself into trouble. And, like, I went ahead and watched his... Man, he is looking, he's looking rough in this video, but I went ahead and watched it. Have you had a chance to check it out? No. Um, like, so I'll turn it down, but I'll just read verbatim what he actually says. Okay. Because it doesn't seem like he's very apologetic at all. Mm -hmm. Like, he doesn't, like, he's apologizing, and he throws, like, he drops in the name, like, Fast and the Furious, like, a <laughs> couple of times. I think he's apologetic because he doesn't want sales to, you know, the new movie. Okay. He's like, hi, I'm John Cena. I have something. Or, uh, I have something right now. In Fast and the Furious Nine, I had many, many interviews. In one of them, I made a mistake. It's like doing sign language here. <laughs> Everyone asked me if I can use Chinese. People at Fast and the Furious Nine 
gave me a lot of interview information. Uh, I made a mistake. I have to say right now, it is so, 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 so important. I love and respect China and Chinese people. I am so, so sorry for my mistake. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. <laughs> you have to understand, I, I love and respect China and Chinese people. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was his whole message. Like, <sighs> that's kind of cool. I didn't realize that he actually knew another language, right? He kind of comes across as just a celebrity he, slash kind of. Yeah, I'm betting he barely learned this. <laughs> He's like, oh, I need to learn some more. But it, it felt so insincere. Disingenuous. D yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he just drops, like, Fast and the Furious 9 a couple of times in there. Says he's so sorry for the mistake. And his mistake was just saying, like, the Chinese people, I don't even know if they asked for a... Or if it was just, like, people on social media that asked for him to apologize because they he made a mistake that he said that they were a country. Because China doesn't like that. I mean, they, they're all... This is all part of China, right? And they didn't like it, apparently. Well, and if someone would ask me, come up and say, hey, is, is Taiwan a country? I would have gone, mm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, uh, yeah, like, I don't know. <laughs> Geography wasn't my strong suit yeah. back in the day. Like, ask me about the U.S. I got that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything outside of that, like, I, I don't know. There's North America, South America. Let's see there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think it was mainly because he doesn't want like the new movie where they go into space to <laughs> to bomb over because China usually it's it's crazy with these movies they do decent over here but then like in other countries they go crazy for yeah. these things. Yeah, big huge, huge explosions. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's kind of a, honestly, it's, I think it's kind of a dumb thing to apologize for. Just came out and be like, oh, my bad. And it didn't even Sorry. seem like he took credit for it because he's just like, hey, Fast and the Furious, these guys, they gave me a lot of, like, information yeah. and stuff. It's like, like, no, it wasn't my fault. It was the bad information that I received from these guys. Yeah. And it's like, dude, you're the one that said it, though. Like, if you're not fact checking it, fact check checking it yourself first, right? Why spout it out? Right. Don't be like a president. <laughs> <laughs> um. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. So, J.J. Abrams has come out and said, uh, "You know, I think." Uh, those Star Wars sequels would have been better if we had more of a plan. <laughs> you don't say, JJ. Um, JJ Abrams was never supposed to direct more than one film in the Star Wars franchise. When he was first approached about tackling Episode Seven, he turned it. Or excuse me, yeah, Episode Seven, he turned it down. Take more convincing, and then uh, on then new Lucasfilm head Kathleen Kennedy's part to get Abrams to agree to sign on. And in doing so, Abrams said at the time he was excited about the idea of creating a foundation from the ground up, from which other stories might grow. Indeed, The Force Awakens had the unenviable task of introducing brand new characters that fans would want to follow, while also servicing fans' desires to see old favorites back on the screen. <clears throat> um... As Abrams was working on The Force Awakens, Lucasfilm wanted to get the next two films in the trilogy off the ground and thus hired Ryan Johnson to write and direct Episode 8 and Colin Trevorrow to write and direct Episode 9. Uh, so when Abrams signed on to take over Episode 9 after Trevorrow left the project, <clears throat> he had yet another, and I'm skipping through the article, obviously. 
he had yet another unenviable task, albeit a completely different one. He had to finish a story he started, but one that had taken some alternate routes in its middle chapter, routes that Abrams wouldn't have necessarily gone down. The resulting film, The Rise of Skywalker, was similarly um, divisive, as Abrams brought the story back around to some ideas he had percolating while making The Force Awakens, specifically um, owing to Ray's parentage. So, basically, he kind of had to play catch-up. Right. Like, he made this first film, and he's basically, okay, I, I laid the groundwork, I set up these stories, and then Ryan Johnson came along, and he was like, no, we're going to do this. These are things that I find most important. Yeah, I'm going to make this Star Wars story, then all of a sudden, you got to tie those two together in the third film, you know, like... Did you... Do, okay. Okay. Did, did J.J. Abrams <sighs> know that there were two other directors for these other movies? Yes, Kay. he did. Uh, couldn't they have all gotten together and gotten on the same page? <sighs> I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, he... I feel like you'd want to, like, collaborate with these guys and say, hey, these are things that I want to, like, bring to the table. This, this, this. Let's have a vision that we can... Well, and we don't know what happened behind the scenes. Maybe they tried to do that. Right. And maybe they're just like, no, I just want to do my own thing. You know, I have my own ideas. You know, um, I want to do this with it and this with it. And... I feel I honestly feel like it's weird because over in the MCU, you know, you're looking at this huge contrast here, but like over in the MCU, they have a vision. Yeah, the director gets a little input and he's just like uh making visual changes, right? Perhaps, but for the most <clears throat> yeah. part they just get a collective paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> right? You you already know that it's going to be a great move like great movie. I'm pretty dang sure that I could probably direct like a fine uh, Marvel movie, just saying, because they've already got a plan in place, and you just kind of have to, like, oh, I kind of envisioned this, I'd like to see more emotion from these characters, I'd like this. But Give over, us Squirrel Girl. Yeah, right? Okay. So we can cast Anna Kendrick in it. <laughs> but then, like, on the other side, where you've got Star Wars, it seems like the directors were able to do whatever they wanted. Yeah. Which seems kind of weird to me. It is in, the, in these huge, larger than life like movies, you know. It is weird. Um, yeah, it does seem like there was kind of a disconnect. You don't usually see that much creativity and that much like, like leeway with a Star Wars movie or or like a movie in general, it, except for like on the smaller screen. Right. Yeah, you think J.J. Um, Abrams would have called up Brian Johnson and be like, okay. Here's my ideas. Here's what I thought the stories would go. I'm going to pitch you a soft little <clears throat> slow ball right here. Dude. Like, yeah. yeah. Here's what I was singing for Ray's parentage. You know, do with that what you will. You can kind of maybe perhaps allude to this. Yeah. Do whatever you want in the middle. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened there. And look, I'm a Star Wars sequel apologist. Yeah. Like, I don't hate them as much as everybody else does. Especially The For Force Awakens. I freaking love that movie. <laughs> but at the same time, I can obviously see the flaws in it. Right. Um, you can obviously see where they were trying just to connect these dots and how the last one was really kind of forced into a um, a place that it had to go into. That like it forced into a tauntaun. Pretty much. <laughs> <clears throat> they were shoved into a tauntaun. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think Abrams ever thought that Snoke was going to be some sort of weird clone of Palpatine or anything like that. Like, I don't think that was his first idea. Right, no. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think he even wanted to bring Palpatine back. Like, I don't think that was ever in the plans to begin with, but I don't know. I don't know the whole story. It would, I, And I'm sure it'll come to light later on, and it'll be really interesting and fascinating to see how it all, like, 
what transpired behind closed doors. Sure. Yeah. Uh, from one universe to the other, Universal reports that it wants a Fast and the Furious and a Jurassic World uh, crossover. Please don't. Universal doesn't boast the same in-depth roster of marketable franchises as many other studios do, but they still know how to write <laughs> uh, ev er, ring every drop of earning pro um, out of these franchises. So 12 out of their 15 highest grossing movies ever uh, hail from the Fast and the Furious, Jurassic Park, and Despicable Me universes bringing a combined total of $15 billion at the box office. Uh, Justin Lin, um, drawing the f Fast and the Furious to a close with the 10th and 11th installment. Uh, Thank is God. Not, he's, he's not opposed to the idea because he does already see that there's going to be quite a few different spins spin-offs from this franchise. Uh, and with the newest one, them going into space, he's just like, it's not out of the realm of possibilities. Like, he, he's not writing it off completely, that this could potentially happen. Uh, but as far as Dom and the dinosaurs, I don't think we're going to see that happen. <laughs> Dom of the dinosaurs? Yeah, you know, so as long as they call it that. <laughs> You're like, we're about family, and these dinosaurs were about family. If you were to make this leap or this crossover, how exactly would you do I that? I have no fucking idea. Right? Uh, unless they just kind of like had an Easter egg where it was... Okay, so hear me out. What if we had these guys... Say Jurassic World existed in the same universe as the Fast and Furious franchise and the Fast and Furious movies, and these guys had to go in and secure some sort of, like, vial of dinosaur DNA. Okay. Um, and along the way, they encounter some other dinosaurs, and some crazy shit happens. Lots of explosions. Sure. Millions of dollars. Sure. I'm in. <laughs> Let's make it. Done. <sighs> Fast and the Furious 13, Dom of the Dinosaurs. I'm in. <laughs> <clears throat> They're going to milk this for all it's worth. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and I don't... I mean, I've said before, those Fast and Furious films... They are kind of a guilty pleasure of mine, but you know, it's not like I'm. I'm saying, oh, let's let's make them forever. You know, like I'm I'm good for them to stop. Yeah, they, at some they, point they like, almost it's have fine. as many uh, Land Before Time movies as they do Fast and the Furious. Movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of dinosaurs, yeah, like I don't know. This is this is weird. Like, I don't, I just don't see how those worlds could cross. Well, they are kind of like uh, hired guns, right, at this point. So they need them to assist these guys in some, go, they're like, hey, you've gone into some crazy ass situations, <laughs> like, we need you to do this and survive. I just don't see how you can bring, like, vehicles into the mix. No, me neither. Um, it'd be like bringing in mixing the worlds of Ghostbusters and Harry Potter. It's like, <laughs> how would that work? You know, uh, nearly headless Nick, uh, starts killing people. I wasn't asking how it actually worked. <laughs> <laughs> the Ghostbusters are called in because nearly headless Nick. Oh, speaking of Harry Potter. Okay. There was actually... A crazy theory that makes a hell of a lot of sense. You know how Harry Potter was a horcrux? Mm hmm Right? Uh, the whole reason that the Dursleys hated him is because when you're close to a horcrux, you kind of have, like, all these horrible feelings, right? These... Right, like, Ron was getting grumpy with the... Horcrux thing, around his thing neck. he was yeah, wearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So the same could be said about the Dursleys. They could have been like a sweet, like nice couple, but because they had a fucking Horcrux living under their stairs, right. <laughs> they were getting a little irritated. The Horcrux under the stairs. <laughs> Damn Horcrux. <laughs> That's interesting. No, I never really. Yeah, I, I never I've seen something that. on that like the other day, and I'm just like, oh, that actually kind of makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. It's like slowly but surely, you know, they were getting more and more angry and grumpy and irritable. Because there's a Horcrux there. Interesting. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um. So because the Black Widow movie is coming out here shortly, I thought maybe uh, if if you guys are interested, if you want to go back and read a little bit about Black Widow and kind of some essential comics, I have a little kind of, I guess it's a list of some of the best solo Black Widow stories. All right. So you have uh, the Itty Bitty Cider. Cider? <laughs> uh, I'm a fan of Itty Bitty Cider. No, Itty Bitty Spider. It has all the makings of a great spy story and a great superhero story, making you wish that Devin Grayson had gotten to do more with the character than two short limited series. Um, or you have The Name of the Rose. Uh, unpowered characters and superhero... Let's see. I'm trying to see, like, little... Synopsis? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you, oh, here we go. How do you stand with gods against all forms of monsters when you don't have any powers? In the name of the rose, Natasha Romanoff answers that exact question. Number three, Homecoming. Is that Black Widow Homecoming? Spider-Man Homecoming? No, it's just Homecoming. Just, Came out years ago. Uh, there's no sorts of stories that force a hero back into action for one last job, and Homecoming is that story for Black Widow. Uh, Breakdown. A follow-up to a later story on the list, Breakdown follows Natasha Romanoff and Yelena Belova, who we're going to meet in this new movie, Yeah. Uh, in something of a face-off scenario that Rucka and Grayson wisely wait until the final chapter to fully reveal. Number five, Web of Intrigue. Might be the oddest inclusion on this list, but not every character had has been blessed with a four-issue arc penciled by George Perez found in the Marvel Fanfare Anthology series. Okay, what was that one called again? Uh, just that last one? Yes. Web of Intrigue. All right. Uh, I'm going to definitely check out the Itsy Bitsy Spy Cider okay. <laughs> and Web, Web of Intrigue. Okay. Sure. Number six, Encircle. At her core, Black Widow is a problem sol solver, and Encircle finds her in a particularly prickly predicament. Her friends on the Secret Avengers have just died, and all she has to do is try to get them back in a personal time travel device. Number seven, Deadly Origin. When you've been in the spy game as long as Black Widow has, you're likely going to deal with some villain or another attempting to kill everyone you love on a pretty regular basis. That's the simple setup for Black Widow Deadly Origin. But it betrays the real draw of the book. Um, Tom Rainey and John Paul Leon. Number eight. The finely woven thread. Long running long running stories often have the difficulty of needing to reconcile different iterations of a character over time. The finely woven thread do does just that for Black Widow. Number nine, Shields Most Wanted. It's not hard to love everyone that Chris Samney does, and Shields Most Wanted sees the superstar artist, along with his daredevil cohort. Mark Wade try to bring even greater depth to Natasha Romanoff's history. And then number 10, Widowmaker. The MCU has touched on Black Widow and Hawkeye's globetrotting past, but Widowmaker explicitly sheds some light on that relationship, at least as it stands in the comic books. All right. So there you go. That one sounds interesting as well because they've alluded to that a lot of the times. So they're like, "Hey, this isn't like you know these like this time." Mm -hmm. 
but they never really gotten into it. And apparently that last one, Widowmaker, also has Wolverine and Winter Soldier in it. Seriously? Yeah. It's a winning combination. So there you go. Just looking for some, uh, if you want to play a little catch up with Black Widow. Which has always been a character that, for me, she's always been there. I've always known who she was, but it's never been a character I'm like, ooh, can't wait for the next Black Widow story, you know? Yeah. Uh, she kind of reminds me a lot of, like, Catwoman. Hmm. She's been around there for a while, but it's just like, eh, she's got a couple of interesting stories, but... Yeah. Well, let's go back to Batman. Let's go back to your bread and butter. All right. Okay. <clears throat> let's get into Revs and Rex. Uh, I know I'm late to the game, and it finally like released last Tuesday on DVD and Blu-ray, uh, Raya and the Last Dragon. Yes. I did get a chance to check this out, one out, and... Like, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty fantastic. I liked how the dragon was basically... It reminded me a lot of Aladdin, where okay. the dragon was kind of like the genie, where he was giving modern references, right. even though it's set back in the day. Okay, I can see that. Um, I, th I thought it was pretty, it was pretty whimsical. Uh, visually, it was very impressive, especially the fight scenes. Visually, it's awesome. Yes. Uh, I did feel like they jumped from, like, place to place. That felt a little rushed. Um, well, did you want, like, long six-hour boat rides from one island to another? Um, I would have liked to a little bit more. In it felt like they had way too many comic relief characters on board. Okay, and I think that's what I said in, in my review. Yeah. Um, I said that they, they kind of overdid the overly cutesy characters. Yeah, yeah, you've got the baby, the monkeys, the boy, right, the right, dragon. Right, right. Like, Yeah, everybody is kind of like got these one-liners. <clears throat> and I almost felt like it didn't have to be set in – it could have been set anywhere. Like, it didn't feel... Like, with a movie like Mulan, I did feel like they tied in the culture a little bit better. Mm -hmm. With this one, I felt like they didn't d dive as deep as they could have with the culture. Well, I don't... I mean, I think it's supposed to, supposed to be vaguely Asian. Right. Th did they um, really allude but to But I don't think they ever specifically said. Whether it was, like, China and, like... China or yeah, like I don't think Taiwan. they ever. I don't think they ever. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think that, that country Taiwan. Yeah. I don't think they ever actually said. I think it's more of a fantasy situation, right? Um, in a fantasy world that slightly resembles Asian culture, but yeah, no, I. So is that I just taking points, or is that just taking stuff from like Asian culture and trying to like, I don't know. I, I felt like because she dropped a couple of times, like the word for father, <clears throat> right? Know, like five or six times throughout the movie, right? And um, I get her motives. It, I, I felt like they could have like resolved their differences, the, like the two girls. I'm trying to like keep this like spoiler free a little bit in case you guys haven't seen it. But uh, overall, I thought it was, like it had some really good moments in it, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, out of five dragons, I'd probably be sitting at like a. Even though the fight scenes were really cool and all, and that kind of like boosted it up a little bit, I'm I'm probably a little bit lower than you, Troy, and I'm sitting at like a two and a half, almost three. I don't remember what I gave it. To be honest with you, but if you like to hear my review, you can go back to the episode hashtag not my Pringles. <laughs> back when we recorded on March fourteenth. Um. You did also see a movie as well, which it's one of it's one of those movies that I might be seeing today or might not, depending on how this review goes. <laughs> mm. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to see Cruella then. Huh? <laughs> yep. Wrath of Man. Yes. 
So <clears throat> here's the quick, quick shot premise here. Jason's Jason Statham plays a guy who gets a job with a security company, armored car where they go pick up money and stuff. Right. And he's doing that because his, um, his son was inadvertently killed in an armored car robbery gone wrong. So he thinks if he's there that he'll eventually find the people that killed his son. Okay. Okay. That's basically the premise. Uh, like I said, it stars Jason Statham. Uh, it's directed by Guy Ritchie. Now, those two have done some pretty cool movies in the past. Yes. Um, this is not one of them. Dang. This is boring. I'll tell you that right now. Seriously. Yeah, it's boring. Which is weird to say because it's it's an action film. But I just I found myself just not caring. <laughs> like you you find you find out more about this guy, and again, I'll I'll leave it you know spoiler free. And you find out more about his past, and then you're like okay, so why should I care about him? Right. Or why should I care about these people? I don't care about anybody in this film. They're all terrible people. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the premise was, it, it, it's, it's, it's nothing you haven't seen before. Uh, the characters are pretty one note. Um, it's just not a, it's just not great. You know, it's just, I expected more. Okay. Let me put it that way. I expected more. Um, I actually fell asleep <laughs> in the theater for like maybe 10 minutes. Oh, geez. Watching it. Yeah. Which during an action movie that shouldn't. Happen. I know. Yeah. Like it's, it was, it was weird. So, <clears throat> out of uh out of five um let's see out of five I don't want to do something as easy as like bullets that's uh <laughs> out of five priuses uh I w- I would give it <sighs> Man, I'm struggling to give it more than one. Seriously? Yeah. Wow. I'll, I'll give it a one and a half. Yeah. I'll give it a one and a half. That was my that was my gut rating. That's rather generous generous of you. But even like even the action scenes were kind of boring and it just it wasn't well paced and yeah, like I said, the characters, you don't really get to know any of the characters that much, and they're all, like, overly, like, like testosterone, bravado, alpha males, and you're just like, okay, I've had enough. It's just, yeah, anyway. Fair, fair enough. So go see Cruella, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so one final thing that I did watch and it was the friends, the reunion on HBO max. Yeah. This one, it brings like all the cast. They have not been together in the same room at the same time in years. Not all six. Yeah. No. Uh, so they go back onto the stage and like you get to see behind the scenes and they just kind of like talk and catch up as friends. Um, right. And it was like, so half of the interview was, or half the thing was just them chilling on the couch and just talking with uh, James Gordon, J- James Gordon in front of the fountain. And they had like a lot of um, cameos and, like lots of the old cast coming back as well, which was really neat. And a lot of, like even some of the cast were in the audience, just kind of chilling there. Mm-hmm. So it was fun. It was fun for the fans. Um, and then like the rest of it was, they were at the apartment and they were playing like um, trivia games together. And they were just kind of like having fun with it. Like they did that famous friends episode. Yes, yeah. exactly. And they definitely, um, except for this time around, uh, the girls end up winning. Yeah. 
Good. Because that's how Joey and Chandler got the apartment, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, they even, you even got to see Joey and Chandler chilling in their chairs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ross talks about how much he hated, like, the monkey. He couldn't stand the monkey. Everybody hated that monkey. Yeah. Uh, he had, like, put it on. Like, they would do a scene, and then the monkey wouldn't hit its mark. So then they'd have to reset it. And he's like, what the hell? Like, yeah. yeah. And you get to see a lot of, like, bloopers that you've never seen before. The Friends cast actually cussing. And it was, it was, it was, it was very enjoyable to go back and, to like, see these guys. Um, I do have to say I know that, like, some of the cast members have been getting a lot of flack on the internet for, like, they've had rough, rough lives and they don't look the same. Matthew Perry? Yeah. 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 Uh, have you seen that, dude? Like, some of the, the hate? Uh, oh, yeah. Heat. But it was really interesting, some of the insight that Matthew Perry, like, dropped on us. He was saying that he became addicted to the laugh and to the joke, and that if he wasn't getting as loud of a laugh as, like, other cast members, that he would, like, resent them, and he would, like, he felt a lot of, like, hate. Like, he needed that He was addicted to the laugh mm. kind of a deal. And if, like, a joke didn't land, then, like... Like, he was always trying to do, like, practical jokes behind the scenes as well, and, like, joking around with other cast members and stuff, but, like, yeah, he, the, I can see, definitely see why he struggled with addiction, like, after the whole Friends series ended. Um, and during it, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's funny you say that, because I've seen, like, a bunch of the Friends bloopers mm -hmm. that are, like, on the D DVDs and stuff, and... You can tell there are a few where Matthew Perry will try saying a joke and no one will laugh. And you can tell that he gets upset. Visual, visually upset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he covers it by saying another joke, but you can tell like his countenance drops. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. That and also like there's a scene where they're in the cafe and um, Joey like trips over like the couch a couple mm -hmm. of times and misses his mark and yeah. keeps doing it. And then finally, uh, Chandler or Matthew Perry, like he comes in and kind of like wants to be part of the joke and like jumps in like on the chair. Oh, he does. That. He does that all the time. Yeah. 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 They, he just wants to be a part of the laugh kind mm -hmm. of a deal. And yeah. Um, they did also do a smelly cat thing, which I didn't think was really necessary. Uh, yeah, it was, it was... What was it? Was it like a big sing-along or something? Uh, yeah, so she starts singing Smelly Cat, um, and then uh, Lady Gaga comes in oh, and sings it, sings it with her, and she's like, hey, thank you for being, I don't know if this is the right words or not, but thank you for being different and an inspiration to people that, like, wanted to truly be themselves no. kind of a deal. And then... Fuck off, okay, Gaga. <laughs> and then, uh, all of a sudden, this big, huge choir comes in, like vocal, like kind of like churchy looking choir comes in and starts singing Smelly Cat together. And it took up a couple of minutes. I'm like, oh my hell. I started fast forwarding yeah. a little bit. Cause that sounds cringy. Yeah. It was definitely not necessary. But like, it was cool to see some of the other cast members and like the surprise cameos that they had. Yeah. I was like, oh, wow, all right. Uh, like, I'm sure they had Tom Selleck. Mm hmm Yep. Um, he, he showed up during the... Because uh, he, he was one of the questions. Like, he did a voice recording, and they said, who is this actor? And then he came on, and he said, like, hey, for bonus points, like, this question, and dropped another question. Yeah. Yep, they did have her, or him. Um, I'm sure they had the gal that played Janice. Mm-hmm. Mm. Janice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the guy who played Gunther. I'm sure he was there. Uh, yep. Yeah, He but he was only there uh, the... Uh, um, Zoom. Oh, really? Yeah. He wasn't important enough to... <laughs> or he could, Was he too he was... busy to fly out? <laughs> yeah. What's what's uh, James Michael Tyler? I think that's his name. What's he doing that's so important? Right. <laughs> uh, James Gordon, I actually thought he did, like, he almost didn't need to be there. No. Because he would just, like, set up these questions for these people and say, like, hey, who had the best laugh? And then they all pointed to Phoebe. And then they're like, well, what about Janice? And then brought her on, kind of a deal. And, <sighs> yeah, he really didn't need to be there. I think he didn't detract from it. Yeah. Like, he was, he was a good moderator, kind of, like, similar to what we've seen, like, you know, at Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. 
I think I think that most of the time with James Corden, it's like he doesn't need to be there <laughs> wherever he is. Like he doesn't need to be there. <laughs> yeah. But overall, like it was pretty cool to see the cast then and now. Um, I know there was some talk about Matthew Perry, kind of his way he was talking, like it was very slow, very slurred, and a lot of people think, "Oh, is he is he on the drugs again? Is he drunk?" I like, know he had. He had oral surgery like yeah. hours before. Oh yeah, I like, cut the guy a break. Uh, you see that like with the surgery, and then also like man, super white teeth, like just yeah, like, yeah, oh yeah. Well, I'm sure he's had them. I'm sure, he's had them done. <laughs> yeah, uh, but overall, like it, it's worth a watch, Troy. You have to check it out. Okay, like, I don't have HBO Max anymore. When you get it, when you get a chance. I'm sure you can find it somewhere under a. It's got to be somewhere, right? right? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure I can find it somewhere, or even like clips. I'm sure there's clips out there somewhere. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I guess you know, as a as a friends fan, I probably should check that out. And it almost got me wanting to watch Friends again. And I was really surprised that some of the cast members uh, haven't seen the whole series mm. all, all the way, I'm like. I think like, most of them have, right? Uh, yeah, there was two. Okay, so can you name the two that have seen it a couple <clears> of times? <throat> I would say the ones that have seen it. There's there's two of them that they've seen it like plenty of times. I would say David Schwimmer and Courtney Cox. Uh, Courtney Cox was one of them, and then what's his bucket, Joey? Matt LeBlanc. Matt LeBlanc. Has seen He's it seen it. Time. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's surprising. I didn't think he... Hmm. Ross, he, like, started watching it again. Like, I call by their names. Like, <laughs> but, like, uh, Ross, he started watching it with, like, his um, his kids and his daughter has, like, started to watch it. And they're, like, coming of age that they'll actually, like, enjoy Okay, it. so that's what it was. Because I've heard, like, older interviews with him a few years back where they're all just like, no, you know, actually, I've never, I've never gone back and watched it. I've never... Yeah. So maybe now they're having kids... Now they're maybe they're going back and okay, and it's crazy the huge like phenomenon that it was. Oh yeah, right. It's ridiculous. Like how like when they started giving up those numbers of how many different languages it was in, and they even did a, a segment where they basically went to different people around the world and like said what an influence it was, you know. And it, it's it was crazy. Like they became stars overnight, and the only people that they could like really relate to and they had to like stick close to was their friends, you know, the other cast members. Yeah. And they also talked about which cat like which cast members what they were doing before they actually started filming and which order they chose the members like these cast members for and it was it was pretty fascinating hmm. okay because i i know a few things about it um because i've done a few videos on it but uh like i know jennifer aniston actually originally went in to read for monica mm-hmm. and courtney cox went in to read for rachel okay they're like no, they those don't fit. Like, let's switch them. There was others, uh, like there was other people that they were on uh, additional shows, but then they got released, like let go from that show, so that they could continue doing Friends. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, like Matt LeBlanc, like he was, he only had a couple dollars left in his pocket before he got oh, Friends. Yeah. yeah, and it was between him and one of the other guys. Actually, it was between him. And the dude that plays his, like, double that, like, he has, like, wearing the jacket. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy was actually the other one that was, like, potentially going to be him. Oh, and, really? Like, he won the job, yeah. It's funny so then they, they brought still, him back. They brought him back, yeah, to pretend to be him. That's funny. How you are you doing? Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> yeah. All right. Um. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> so this is uh this is the first episode of the month. So those on World War G, you're going to be getting or Podbean, you're going to be getting the whole episode. Yeah. But if you'd like to get all the episodes, go to Patreon.com/WorldWarG. Um, or like I said, you can go to WorldWarG.Podbean.com. Uh, normally they're only in half-hour chunks, except the one at the beginning of the month. 
You can go to facebook.com slash worldwarg. You can find our merchandise at tpublic.com, which I gotta... I gotta go look. I gotta maybe update some stuff on that, but anyway. You can email us anytime, day or night, at worldwargpod at gmail.com. So... This has been World War G. That has been AJ. That has been Troy. Could you be any geekier, my friends? Oh. Oh.